Affairs hearing entitled United States Contributions to the Response to Pakistan's Humanitarian Crisis, the Situation and the Stakes will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection, so ordered. We'll proceed to the opening statements. Before I do, I want to welcome our guests uh, that are here, Mr. Bacon, of course, uh, and our guests that are coming quite a distance. Uh, and we really appreciate it uh, for your help and for your patience. I apologize uh, for the pack. Uh, Sherry Raymond, you know how legislators can be and how the votes come and they, uh, and they take a while. And so we apologize to you, both you and Samina Ahmed uh, for the period of time that it took us well beyond the 2 o'clock start period. And, and thank you for your patience. I'm going to waive most of my opening statement in deference to the time that uh, witnesses have already spent. Uh, sub to just say and set the table a little bit here for, for the fact that over the last seven weeks, the Pakistani military has, of course, been involved in an intensive offensive. Uh, the long and short of it has been, of course, that a lot of people, uh, because of the tactics used and the artillery, the airstrikes, uh, has had a, a sizable effect on the civilian population and led to the displacement of many, many people. The estimates of how many vary, uh, but I know uh, Samina Ahmed's estimate, I think, was about 2.8 million. About 1.9 million have been registered uh, and, and verified, and there are a number of others that are there. Obviously, one of the issues is that some are in camps, other in various other types of establishments and homes where they're receiving hospitality from uh, members of families and, and friends on that. Uh, this is obviously a, a situation for those that are still in the areas where fighting rages, where curfews and landmines and other uh, conflict issues leave those people frozen. They are not able to get out and avoid uh, being caught in the middle of what is happening there. Uh, there are a number of NGOs who are working to ensure that people have food and shelter and adequate medical supplies. Um, but obviously, we need more help and more people on that. So this is a fundamental challenge. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in the short term dealing with people's needs, but also we'd like our witnesses to address what uh, needs to be done uh, in the long term and who should be responsible for it and all of the aspects that go forward. This is obviously a dangerous opportunity for extremist groups uh, to get in and help people and try to win them over to their uh, perspective, but is also a chance for the Pakistani government uh, to step in and organize a relief situation and uh, win the trust of the people there in a long-term relationship and gather some uh, support back from the people in this area of Pakistan. I want to stop at that point in time. I'll, I'll go on. I'll allow Mr. Flake to make an opening statement if he wishes, and then we'll just go to our witnesses for testimony uh, before we get back to the questions and answers. I know members will want to ask some questions. Thursday, both uh, all of you will want to know that we have Ambassador Richard Holbrook and Under Secretary of Defense Michelle Flournay, who will be here discussing a number of related issues. Uh, so things that you say here today may well help us inform some of the questioning that will go on on Thursday's hearing as well. Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the, in the interest of time, I'll just submit my statement for the record and just uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their patience. Thank you very much. Uh, let me briefly introduce then the witnesses that we have here today. Uh, we're going to have this hearing and then we're going to proceed to a briefing, not a hearing, but a briefing from the United Nations uh, Human Rights Group as the second panel. The testimony we're about to receive will be from Dr. Samina Ahmed, who is the South Asia Project Director for the International Crisis Group. There she oversees the ICG's operations in Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and Nepal. In that capacity, she analyzes the political, social, economic, and military factors that increase the risks of extremism, internal conflict, and war, and she makes policy recommendations to overcome those threats. From 1999 to 2001, Dr. Ahmed served as a research fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Prior to that, from 1990 to 1997, she was a senior research analyst at the Institute of Regional Studies. Dr. Ahmed holds a Ph.D. from Australian National University. Ms. Sherry Raymond serves as a member of parliament in the National Assembly of Pakistan from the Pakistan People's Party. From 2008 to 2009, she served as federal minister for information and broadcasting. She currently serves as a member of the Parliamentary Committee on National Security. Prior to joining the National Assembly, Ms. Raymond worked as a journalist, most notably as editor of the Pakistan-based Herald News Magazine. She's a longtime activist advancing the cause of better access to health and educational resources, particularly for women and children from the lower income sections of Pakistani society. 
Ms. Raymond holds degrees from Smith College and the University of Sussex. Mr. Kenneth Bacon serves as president of Refugees International, a position he's held since 2001. From 1994 to 2001, Mr. Bacon served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs, where he was the Pentagon's chief spokesman. Prior to that, he worked as a reporter, editor, and columnist for the Wall Street Journal's Washington Bureau. Mr. Bacon holds a BA from Amherst College, as well as an MBA and an MA from Columbia University. So again, I want to thank all of you for sharing your expertise and your insight. Uh, and I want to thank Ambassador Patterson and her staff at the United States Embassy in Islamabad for their assistance in facilitating this, hearia, this hearing. We greatly appreciate the help there. It's the policy of the subcommittee to swear in witnesses before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. Sherry and Samina, if you would you please stand and raise your right hands as well. We're going to, there you go. Uh, is there any person that can help Mr. Bacon testify who want them to do the same? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. I assume that I assume that your your phone has been uh, taken off of mute, Samina and uh, Sherry. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, would you be kind enough to uh, start with an opening statement? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Cherney. And thank you for holding this important meeting on a humanitarian crisis of immense proportions in Pakistan. You have laid out quite clearly the dimensions of the problem and the reasons for it. Let me just say this, that we in the crisis group have been deeply concerned about not just the peace deal that led to this particular crisis in um, the Malakand district of the Northwest Frontier Province, because clearly it was again a peace deal that allowed the Taliban to expand their control. And once there was popular discontent and, of course, U.S. pressure, the military took action. But that action, as you pointed out, was hasty, it was ill thought out, and has led to this massive exodus of people. We are as concerned as you, sir, about the threat that is posed by the jihadi extremists in this area, with their links to Al-Qaeda, and they, the potential that they could exploit this crisis um, to gain access to more recruits to try and win hearts and minds. That is why it is so important that relief, reconstruction, rehabilitation must take place in a way that meets the needs and empowers the communities. Let me say this, sir, that these are people who have fled a brutal Taliban rule for all practical purposes. They want to see an end to the militancy, the presence of militants in their areas. They want to lead normal lives. They want to go back home. The U.S. and its assistance has been greatly welcomed in Pakistan, but there is much more that can be done. It's important for the U.S. to understand that this is not just and as it should be a humanitarian operation um, and meeting humanitarian needs, but it also serves U.S. national security interests. If we see the jihadis as we are already witnessing on the ground taking advantage of this situation, um, then we have a problem on our hands. We will see the militants making a comeback. We will see them expanding their control once again. So it's equally important for us to, for the government of Pakistan to understand the importance of not allowing banned organizations such as the lashkar e Tayyaba's latest reincarnation, the Falai -e Insaniyat Foundation from operating in these regions. It is equally important for the government of Pakistan to understand that for any effective rehabilitation and reconstruction, there will be need for civilian law enforcement and the civilian intelligence agencies that can best bring these militants to justice. A reform judiciary is essential, as are long overdue political reforms in Malakan Division and in FATA. These IDPs are not only from let, let me stress that 
from Malakan Division. The 2.8 million or so are from Malakan, but there are 500,000 IDPs from FATA as well. Here is an opportunity for the United States and for the Pakistan government to win hearts and minds. But to do so, it will be absolutely essential that the assistance that's given is urgently provided, it is appropriate, it supports a civilian-led process, and it prioritizes the needs of non-camp IDPs, since the vast majority, more than 85% of these IDPs, are in fact living outside government-run camps. They're living in communities that are hosting, amongst communities that are hosting them, in shelters, in schools. It's important to think outside the box on how this assistance should be provided. We, in our report, Crisis Group issued a report on this um, on 3rd of June, have said, look, think about cash-based assistance for income, for education, for health, for vocational training, it pays dividends. Documentation is possible. There is less chance of pilferage and wastage. And it would put a, an, a humane face by empowering the community's concern. It's important that the United States also encourage the civilian government's desire to enact political and constitutional reform, not just in Malakan Division, but also in FATA. Finally, and let me end with this, sir, it is equally important that the United States warns the Pakistani military against entering into yet another appeasement deal, such as the deal that it signed with the Taliban and their supporters in Swat that have led to this crisis and that will only, not only undermine the security of the Pakistani state and its citizens, but also gravely harm U.S. national security interests. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. We appreciate that and the report that you did on uh, June 3rd. That was extremely helpful as well. Uh, Ms. Rahman, we'd be happy to hear your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Tierney. Thank you, Chairman Tierney and members of the subcommittee for taking notice of the magnitude and scale of this uh, humanitarian crisis that Pakistan is facing today. It is certainly the largest transfer of uh, refugees and uh, human uh, uh, in people, rather, from uh, one place to another in the history of this region. Pakistan has not encountered anything like this since the migration of refugees from undivided India in 1947. So clearly our response to the IDP's challenge is of concern to you. It is more of concern to Pakistanis as well because this challenge has become, as I said earlier, a critical test of our response and our ability, the Pakistan government's ability to maintain a public resolve and a sustained campaign against militancy and terrorism in the name of religion. Now, the principal challenge, uh, Chairman, for the Pakistan government today is twofold. To uh, provide urgent relief for the frontier provinces displaced millions uh, and also, obviously, to maintain public support for a military operation with high human costs. These two projects are inextricably linked, as noted here. Uh, any serious lapses in coordinated relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruction efforts, which will come later, will create uh, and will endanger uh, the fragile uh, public coalition and consensus needed for powering the morale so vital for a sustained military operation and its successes. Now, the stakes for us couldn't be higher. Uh, Chairman, Pakistan is at a critical juncture today. Our government has been able to use the public recoil generated by Taliban excesses in the fallout of a flawed peace deal between the Malakan militants and the provincial government to its advantage. Before this specific episode, let me say that public opinion on militancy was divided down the line and it was muddied by religious symbolism as well as partisan public opinion. Uh, even today as we speak, many religious parties and other leaders have little hesitation, these are non-mainstream but they're very much in the public discourse, have little hesitation in condemning the campaign against terrorism as an American-sponsored strategy with little gain for Pakistan. And they do conflate the suffering of the IDPs with uh, the failure 
uh, of the state to, to reach a consensus through dialogue with the militants. And as mentioned already, uh, the peace deals that have resulted in uh, the Taliban regrouping jihadist forces, uh, gathering space and momentum, have been fundamentally flawed, certainly in the Pakistan experience, and have almost always uh, generated this kind of uh, jihadist counterbalance to the state's writ. Now, for us, this is as much a project of reclaiming lost territory, reinstalling the Pakistan flag, but also of expanding the writ of constitutional rule, guaranteeing fundamental entitlements which were seriously endangered uh, under the Taliban rule, uh, empowering state institutions to function in a sovereign democratic plurality. Now, I have to state here at this point that time is as much an enemy to this project as terrorism. Why I say this is because the displacement of nearly three million people over a period of three weeks has caused a huge overstretch on government capacity on multiple fronts. In fact, the figure I have today from government, which includes the earlier uh, tribal area refugees referred to from Bajor, uh, numbers to a staggering 3.9 million. Now, this is unprecedented in the history of the region and I would think probably the world. The equation is, again, uh, very compelling and simple. If the trauma of internal migration, subhuman camp conditions of curfew casualties and lost family members is not mitigated and relieved soon, we will see human anguish beginning to drain public resolve for the military operation, which I stated is very essential for reclaiming the writ of uh, Pakistan in many areas. So the longer this humanitarian crisis goes on, our space for the larger existential battle against terrorism shrinks, and public confidence in government also obviously goes down. These camps remain uh, hotbeds and sanctuaries for recruiting a larger mindset uh, towards terrorism, and we have to guard against uh, our, uh, the state's right now overstretch uh, and provide as much assistance both from civilian support and international assistance in terms of immediate relief uh, and food security operations. Uh, a concern that is uh, emerging now is that as the theater of operation expands towards the tribal areas, which it has already, the pressure of another wave of refugees will and may trigger a fresh crisis. Uh, and a main issue of concern is that the, once terrorists are flushed out, uh, they will be able to or may be able to escape uh, through routes via the Afghan border, especially via Waziristan. And this uh, prospect of a return and regroup of Malakan once they find sanctuary perhaps in Afghanistan will reverse all gains made at such high human cost. So this is something to think about, and we feel that the U.S. can and should intervene in perhaps in the Kabul, uh, with Kabul in the Trilateral Commission to start maximizing opportunities for border interdiction at this point, because there is very little uh, uh, symmetry on in terms of the effort Pakistan's putting in on the border uh, and uh, the other side especially from, obviously, Kabul. Now, the other thing that is of concern is that there is a sense that the international community has been slow to respond to the crisis. Only a small amount of $430 million pledged has actually been translated into goods and relief. And I cannot help but reiterate the magnitude of the crisis and uh, the ability of government to cope at such short notice and with uh, overstretched abilities. The UN also has warned that its appeal of $543 million in emergency aid is still unmet, and if by July, I would say in a, in a week or so, the deficit in international commitments continues at 80 percent, which it is right now, food supplies to the camps will be severely compromised, and of course this will be, uh, uh, this will be a, represent a fresh humanitarian disaster. Oxfam has also testified to this, and so has the World Food Program. And the government of Pakistan has allocated 50 billion rupees in the budget for RRR efforts, 
but I fear that these will be diverted to food, food uh, provisions and urgent supplies in terms of relief, uh, again, taking away from the cash grant so vitally needed per refugee and the space needed for reconstruction and rehabilitation. Uh, the international community can certainly provide the resources for the Pakistan state to emerge as a major welfare uh, agent and obviously we are in a moment of opportunity here to put jihadist groups that have been uh, using welfare activities as a cover to uh, funnel, uh, to, to, to carry on their aid activities, to carry on their proselytization as well as uh, other activities and uh, we must obviously use this opportunity in partnership with the United States and other members of the international community uh, but I must state here that there is a concern again on the ground that while all governments in Pakistan have shown a below average ability and capacity to execute budget allocations there is no comparison to the, to the aid reflux of US money when it is rerouted back through intermediaries and earmark contractors. Basically, uh, the sense here is that we are getting something like uh, 40 to 50 cents to each dollar of aid money that comes through uh, earmark contractors, and that is something that we need to look at. I won't overlap with what has already been said. Clearly, a large-scale reform in FATA in the PATA areas, which is Malakan Division, is also the order of the day. Uh, reconstruction of infrastructure is a critical concern. I'm told that gas, water and pipelines are being relayed very urgently, but again, uh, we must be very careful to ensure the security of, Talib, uh, of the returnee, refugee returnees when they go back to their homes, there is an urgency obviously to return because life in camps is, is debilitating. Uh, we must also look towards guaranteeing their security once they've returned by uh, insisting and uh, working on uh, enhancing the capacity of police uh, to return back to Malakan Division because they had initially fled. And these uh, uh, civilian forces as well as Frontier Corps levies should form the bulwark of uh, any future security arrangements that are put in place for uh, government oversight and civilian uh, security to the area. Uh, one, again, area of concern that is being uh, stated is that there is a little sense, uh, uh, again, of how much, uh, uh, what the cost Pakistan has incurred in terms of uh, this ongoing battle. The budget recently announced uh, $35 billion incurred by Pakistan. And as you know, Pakistan's society and urban centers most recently especially have been transferred, uh, transformed rather into battle zones after the, particularly after the operation was launched. Peshawar itself, the capital of the frontier province, has witnessed 18 bomb blasts since this operation uh, ha had begun. So uh, we are really concerned about uh, enhancements of security capacity uh, and state abilities now to uh, carry on with what will clearly be a long-term sustained uh, venture. Uh, I think there has to be attention paid uh, to uh, giving serious, uh, not just inputs, but aid inflows, not just to the refugees, because that is a clear and present crisis, but also to the next step before we send refugees back uh, to uh, an unprotected environment. This is essential for us to look at. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to say again, to avoid overlap, there is a great deal of concern that we are paying, as I said, a high human cost in this battle. And uh, if there is a troop surge in uh, Afghanistan by the U.S. forces, which we know is imminent, then how are we going to protect against pressure uh, of the Taliban coming in from Afghanistan again. Once again, I will stress that the border and Durand line must be fortified if we are also to guard against, against sanctuaries um, on both sides of the border. And this will address mutual concerns of uh, both countries using each other's soil to launch attacks, uh, to allow attacks to be launched. And this is something that we certainly don't want to countenance in Pakistan. 
and we are hoping that uh, the United States will be able to use its good offices and leverage in the Trilateral Commission to uh, ensure that there is not a return of uh, regroup Taliban into, uh, back into our areas. Uh, we are looking, obviously, uh, in the short run and medium term to uh, enhance Pakistan government's capacity to deliver on the basic obligations of governance, justice, and social service delivery. Those are diminished as we speak because of the overstretch, but on security fundamentals as well. Finally, I'd like to say that we must uh, enable our compact to renew a strong state-citizen relationship that allows uh, the government and civilian uh, capacity more influence over the regions that had earlier been exploited by non-state actors because of existing constitutional and political gaps which we feel must be filled. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions as we proceed. Uh, I think a lot more needs to be said, but thank you once again for providing this opportunity for us to uh, give our inputs. Well, thank you very much for your comments, and of course your written remarks and articles that you've written have also been uh, shared with the committee, and we'll have some questions for you after Mr. Bacon's testimony, so thank you. Mr. Bacon, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this timely and important hearing. The Obama administration has made clear that Pakistan is one of America's most important strategic partners, and now that partner is afflicted by one of the world's most rapidly growing humanitarian emergencies. Refugees International, an independent advocacy agency, has been surveying displacement in Pakistan for more than a decade. Pakistan generously hosted millions of Afghan refugees during the Soviet occupation. This crisis is different because it involves the displacement of Pakistanis and because it has arisen so quickly. Sadly, the current humanitarian challenges are likely to get worse before they get better. The government of Pakistan is expanding its current campaign against the Taliban into South Waziristan, which could trigger additional displacement. And the monsoon rains are about to begin, complicating the provision of supplies and raising new health and sanitation challenges such as cholera. As ref a Refugees International team recently returned um, from Pakistan where it surveyed internal displacement, it found that, one, the needs are enormous, as most have fled without anything and sought shelter in camps or with relatives. Two, the UN and aid agencies are struggling to respond to the most pressing needs, but funding has been scarce. Furthermore, the funding has that has been pledged has not been distributed expeditiously to meet the needs that have arisen, nor in the most effective way. Three, relief efforts have so far been focused on camps, whereas the vast majority of the displaced, over 80 percent, are staying with host families who are quickly running out of resources. One aid organization has reported pockets of starvation and trauma amongst the population remains a protection priority. Women and girls are particularly vulnerable. Changes in, four, changes in the way the United Nations and the Pakistani military are operating could reduce displacement and improve humanitarian response. Five, all parties, the U.S., the U.N., and the government of Pakistan must prepare for further displacement. And six, it is premature to expect internal refugees to go home. An independent team should assess the sustainability of returns. To respond to this humanitarian emergency, the UN issued at the end of May a $543 million humanitarian appeal. This latest appeal includes emergency relief projects by all UN agencies and a number of international NGOs and calls on donors to respond generously and immediately to one of the largest displacement crises in the world. Despite the urgency of the situation and the strategic importance of the region, the response has been insufficient and the appeal remains severely underfunded, with only 26 percent of it pledged to date. The appeal for food is less than 50 percent funded. The protection cluster of the appeal is only 1 percent funded. To date, the U.S. has been by far the most generous donor, with $164 million during this fiscal year. A further $200 million request was submitted by the Obama administration for Congress for emergency funding to aid organizations, as well as to meet traditional 
levels of U.S. funding to the U.N. Refugee Agency and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. It is encouraging that the conference report for the pending emergency supplemental has the House and Senate agreeing to an emergency appropriation of $225 million. Equally important, the funding should be directed toward the International Disaster Assistance Account to assure it is distributed efficiently to meet the needs of internally displaced people. I hope that Congress will quickly approve this request. The humanitarian community in Pakistan has, raised the, has praised the U.S. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance for deploying an emergency team in the field and for responding quickly to funding requests from NGOs. It is crucial that Congress support these efforts and approve the supplemental request so it can be quickly distributed. Despite having a donor coordination group, other donors have been noticeably absent until now or shown limited generosity. The European Commission's Humanitarian Office just announced a 22 billion euro contribution, while the UK so far has provided 22 million pounds. But much more needs to be done if the international community wants to respond effectively to humanitarian needs. Today, Her Majesty Queen Noor Al Hussein, a member of the Refugees International Board of Directors, and I are sending letters to the Office of the Islamic Conference and to foreign ministers and ambassadors of Arabic countries urging their generous support of the humanitarian appeals. I've attached a copy of that letter for the record. The lack of sufficient assistance to the displaced is already having serious consequences. According to the UNHCR, most of the new arrivals in the camps were previously staying with host families. They can no longer afford to do so and, and are therefore resorting to putting up with heat temperature rises to about 110 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and poor living conditions in the camps. The government started to distribute uh, 25,000 Pakistani rupees, roughly the equivalent of $300 to each IDP family, but is now backtracking, saying it might only distribute the sum of money to half of those registered, as it, un as it is unclear where it will be able to get the funds. This is both a humanitarian and a security challenge. In a development that Refugees International has witnessed elsewhere, and which my fellow witnesses have commented on, um, the vacuum in assistance is being filled by politically motivated actors to gain popular support and allegiance. According to international and national aid agencies, political parties active in Pakistan have set up shop in the, sta in the camps and amongst host communities and provide various services from distributing fans to providing mobile phone cards to the displaced. The majority of international aid organizations and UN agencies work through local partners because of their expertise and their ability to access remote areas. Many Pakistani organizations also obtain their funding from foundations and donations in parallel to the UN cluster system. Local organizations are a critical part of overall relief effort because they have in-depth knowledge of the environment and sustain programs over an extended period of time. From a financial perspective, they are also much more cost efficient than international NGOs as their overheads are much lower. What's more, using local organizations helps to build local capacity and strengthens uh, Pakistan's humanitarian infrastructure. I hope that the U.S. will work with the U.N. to um, encourage uh, greater participation and greater funding uh, by local NGOs. In conclusion, while the displacement crisis in Pakistan is nearly a year old, its magnitude, the scope of the needs, and its political implications of this crisis have not been fully grasped in foreign capitals. The international response has been far too slow. The ongoing humanitarian operation is only the start of what will have to be a prolonged and massive aid effort. Displaced families need immediate relief and in time will require renewed confidence and support to return home in safety and dignity. The Obama administration has repeatedly stated the geostrategic importance of the region and is seizing this opportunity to show concern and leadership. It is not merely a question of funding though the humanitarian assistance and reconstruction efforts will need robust financial commitments. The United States 
has clear national objectives in Pakistan, and these can be advanced by showing concern for the fate of civilians and for helping Pakistanis to meet their needs and to build a more peaceful, prosperous future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. I appreciate it. Thank all the witnesses for their testimony. We're going to go into a period of questioning here. We generally do five minutes for each member and then circle through again. Uh, there's almost more material here than we can cover in, in one hearing, uh, but we'll do the best we can. I, in the International Crisis Group report that Dr. Ahmed prepared, uh, there were comments there about the relief organs, the state relief organs being overly centralized and an indication that the military continues to dominate key institutions and that undermines the civilian capacity. Uh, the, the question that I would have is, does the civilian government in Pakistan have the actual capacity to take charge of this relief uh, prospect, both in the short term and in the long term plan planning for a return, and is there a willingness to uh, try to assign to the military a different role uh, than that of running the relief program and instead take that over on the civilian side? Uh, either of uh, our witnesses in Pakistan might want to address that in, in any order. One of the problems lies in the fact that the civilian institutions have, as a result of almost a decade of military rule, certainly lost some of the capacity that they originally had. This is not to say that the bureaucracy, the civil bureaucracy, and the civilian government lacks the capacity to plan, lacks the line ministries of the civilian government, lack the capacity to implement, and certainly, and it's very important right now for us to understand you need a civilian face even more so because of the history of this conflict and how it has unraveled to have the military run the show in terms of relief or plan ahead as it seems to indicate right now uh, on ch taking charge of reconstruction is to talk about not just a centralized approach but through an institution that has very little knowledge of and a very poor record of working with civilians and with civilian institutions. This undermines that entire process of ensuring that communities are empowered and that they are a part of the process. As my fellow witness said, local NGOs exist. They have the capacity. Local governments exist. They have the capacity. Elected governments exist, and let's hope that we can build that capacity as opposed to falling back on strengthening the military, which serves neither the purposes of that institution nor the interests of the IDPs. Thank you. Well, Ms. Raymond, let me ask you this, and do you agree with uh, Dr. Ahmed's assessment? If you do, what is the Pakistani government, the parliament, and the prime minister doing uh, in terms of asserting leadership on the, uh, rel the relief effort? Well, I think what's going on here is that over the last few weeks, we have seen uh, camp realities uh, literally transform, and that really has been an effort of uh, mostly local government in the frontier province, which is uh, done through the Emergency Relief Unit, ERU, and uh, certainly there is room for expanding the civilian component of all uh, aid and relief and rehabilitation activities. Perhaps in reconstruction activities, yes, the military might be a, a better partner for the heavy lifting part. This is not good. <laughs> Well, we will work on, on correcting that. While that's uh, interesting enough, this morning we had a hearing in the education field about technology in the classroom, and the microphones here didn't work, but it worked fine in the classroom. Mr. Bacon, let me ask you, uh, while that's being corrected, um, do you see the United States making any concerted effort to actually focus its aid to local NGOs and, and more local enterprises that have a perhaps better and more knowledgeable relationships, or are they still moving through the military in Pakistan and other centralized aspects where we might run into the danger of losing some 40 to 50 cents uh, out of every dollar, as Ms. Raymond said earlier. 
Well, it's my understanding from talking to Ambassador Holbrook and his staff that they are very aware of the need to build civilian capacity. And they see this, uh, once one, as a humanitarian challenge, but two, as a great opportunity to help uh, build civilian infrastructure in Pakistan. So my hope is that they would be paying attention to this. Um, certainly USAID is clear on the need to deal with local NGOs. And there are, as Dr. Ackman said, many capable uh, local NGOs in Pakistan. Um, many of them did very good work during the earthquake, um, in two after the earthquake in 2005. And um, we need to build on that, that capacity and, uh, and uh, bring these people into the system in a much more effective way. There's a, apparently a problem in Islamabad, so they're uh, trying to call and get that back online. We'll do that as soon as we can. And until then, sir, you're in hot seat. So, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sure here. you don't mind on that. Mr. Flake, why don't I let you ask some questions to Mr. Bacon, and then we'll uh, allow that for the other witnesses when they come back. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. Um, with uh, this increase in humanitarian aid going, uh, it's an increase, I mean, a lot of it's local contractors, I recognize, but there's going to be a greater U.S. presence, I assume. How can we uh, assure the safety of those who are acting on our behalf uh, without uh, making it seem like a military effort with so many military there to protect them? What, how do we strike a proper balance in your view? Well, that's precisely um, one of the reasons for using um, local NGOs, because they are uh, Pakistanis who live in the community. They know the people there and um, they know the, the habits and the risks that they face. Um, international contractors are harder to protect than, than local people. So the advantage of the local NGOs is that they're well-known quantities. Um, they're seen as providing aid and help to their neighbors. And they can do this usually for much less cost than bringing in uh, people from, uh, from American contracting firms. Um, so security generally is, is easier for locals than it is for internationals. Not always across the board, but generally much easier. Mm -hmm. With that comes a risk that you don't know what you're getting sometimes. I mean, you, you can vet uh, those that you contract with. Uh, but how do we ensure that uh, we're not uh, using or contracting with, with some who may have sympathies uh, to, with the Taliban or, or with well, those who've been working? I mean, we, that, that's I, a very legitimate that's question. Problem. It's a very legitimate question. And um, I think, as my uh, fellow witnesses said, there's a, a great deal of antipathy to, to the Taliban. And what people are looking for is effective aid and help right now. Uh, so I think, again, we rely on local intelligence and local capacity to inform us on who's, who's good and who's bad. It's not. Um, you are the first person to join the conference. It's not foolproof, but it's a, it's a way to start. Clearly, they know better than we know. Um, and um, we have to build trust in them and give them a little bit of, uh, of uh, operating room and some money and uh, clear guidance, uh, clear goals, um, ways to uh, evaluate their progress, metrics and work with them as, as we do with our own contractors. We, uh, <clears throat> we obviously put restrictions and, and directives and mandates on the, the aid that we provide. Mm -hmm. Is there a difficulty in, in uh, aligning that with the goals uh, of other organizations that have uh, broader, I guess, participation, be it UNHCR or the Red Crescent or whoever else is operating there? Do, do, for example, with the legislation that we just passed, um, is it going to be a problem aligning the goals that we've laid out with, uh, with other aid organizations? I don't think it should be. I think that uh, we and UNHCR and the International Federation for the Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies share the same goals. We want effective programs. Um, we want displacement to end. We want poverty to end. We want to find ways to work together. So I, I don't think this sh should be an issue at all. Right. It was mentioned that uh, most of those who are displaced uh, uh, find refuge with family members or mm -hmm. with others and, and aren't necessarily in the camps. Um, it, and, and it's been advocated that we uh, 
put direction their way as well. Uh, but where is the most acute need in your view? Is it uh, uh, in these camps or, or is it um, um, somewhere else? Well, since 80% of the people aren't in camps, we have to find an effective way to get aid to people who are living with the local population. This is uh, both good and bad. Camps aren't a great place to be. Um, but it is easy to deliver aid, uh, medical care, food, et cetera, to people in camps when they're centralized. It's much harder to do this in a dispersed population. Uh, but through a good registration process, which the UNHCR has set up, um, it's, it's possible to do that. But it, it's more time consuming, it's more expensive, and it's not as easy as it is in camps. On the other hand, people are generally much more comfortable um, in private houses uh, than they are in camps. But we, so there are reports of 25 people living in a room in some of these houses. So these are not uh, cushy conditions for the displaced people. It's very, very difficult uh, for them to be absorbed by generous host families. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Uh, as you can see, the chairman, uh, Mr. Tierney, had to go take a phone call. He will be uh, back uh, shortly. Uh, I welcome back to our uh, witnesses who are with us uh, from Pakistan, Dr. Ahmed and Ms. Reman. Are, are, you, are you with us? We want to just make sure it's all hooked up again. Very good. Very good. Uh, and I apologize for actually joining the hearing a little late after uh, some of the testimony, but I think that uh, all of us see in recent events uh, some positive developments, but also obviously some potentially dangerous developments. When I speak of positive, obviously I'm not talking about the internally displaced people, but I'm talking about the fact that uh, the government of Pakistan uh, has taken the threat of the Pakistani Taliban seriously uh, and deployed their forces in a meaningful way uh, to try and address the threat. Uh, the unfortunate consequence, of course, is you do have internally uh, displaced persons. You have lots of refugees within uh, Pakistan. And the challenge for all of us uh, is to make sure that uh, these individuals, these families, uh, get the support that they need uh, from uh, the government of Pakistan and from local NGOs uh, as appropriate. Uh, and uh, you know, we need to figure out the best way of deploying uh, those resources. Uh, among the displaced persons, of course, are um, uh, many uh, children. In fact, according to Save the, Save the Children's rapid assessment of the IDPs, 54% uh, are under the age of 18 and more than 16% are below uh, the age of 5. Uh, is there anything in particular being done to address uh, that population? Obviously, that population is you know, mixed in with their family members, uh, but I don't, I, I'm interested in whether or not uh, special efforts are being made to help the most vulnerable among them. Well, well first of all, um, women and children are always the most vulnerable uh, in displaced populations. And there is, uh, there has been some progress. I know that the, uh, the Pakistani um, Ministry of Health has, in the midst of this crisis, been able to vaccinate 500,000 children against polio. So there is special attention being paid to the health needs of children. They're also working on a program to uh, improve uh, uh, maternal and, and child health care um, in the midst of this as well. So the government and its partners are paying a lot of attention to meeting the health and nutritional needs of children. Okay. Uh, and this is a question for, for all of um, you. What's your best assessment right now as to uh, how the, the, the government of Pakistan, uh, with any help they're receiving from the international community, how they're doing uh, in terms of providing uh, support and resources uh, that uh, are needed? Uh, and juxtaposed to that, how would you assess the extent to whether uh, some of the, the components of the Taliban uh, are able to uh, take advantage of this situation to try and provide social services uh, as well. Uh, because as we all know, this is in some ways a, a race for the hearts and mind and a fight for the hearts and mind of, of the people in these areas. And when you're hungry and displaced, you will turn to services wherever you can get them. Uh, so how would you evaluate as of today 
uh, the extent to which uh, the government, uh, through all its different mechanisms, uh, is providing those services, and to what extent uh, do we have information about uh, whether or not uh, the, the Taliban forces and the allied forces are providing, are coming in to try and fill the vacuum, and, and whether or not they're successful at filling that vacuum? Well, it's a very comprehensive question, and uh, probably my Pakistani colleagues could better answer. But first, I would state that uh, I hope that the uh, government of Pakistan can find a less uh, disruptive and intrusive way to launch this military campaign, one that concentrates more on reducing or limiting displacement. Um, uh, two, I think the government is doing a good job, but it is not getting the support it deserves from the rest of the world, and it needs uh, far more resources than it has. Um, three, I do believe that um, it's an opportunity to build local capacity and they should concentrate more on doing that. And four, in terms of the, uh, of the Taliban, it's my assessment, and I have not been to Pakistan recently, that the government has a great opportunity to show its concern uh, for the people and in fact is seizing that opportunity. And the Taliban is quite, um, uh, is, has created a lot of antipathy on the part of the people. So this again is another opportunity for the government. Thank you. Dr. Ahmed and uh, Ms. Raymond? Is the government of Pakistan- If I may address that. Yes, uh, the government of Pakistan, as stated earlier, is um, extremely overstretched, number one, uh, because of the magnitude of the crisis. It is uh, very difficult to register and even track down families that are outside camps. Uh, the UNHCR certainly has set up a process. So has the database, the national database in Pakistan. It's called NADRA. Uh, the process is difficult. Uh, Pakhtun uh, traditions also make it a challenge for uh, officials and uh, a state uh, um, administration uh, people to go inside homes. Many may be more comfortable than they are in the camps, but they are certainly uh, not living in, in conditions that are anywhere near optimal or what they were used to in their own homes. They're mostly situated in uh, homesteads and patios on uh, outside on the ground in people's homes, 25, uh, 50 plus are coming in to be accommodated by each family. So this is a, a major issue, and I, I, I think that there will be an overstretch even on Pashtun hospitality. So we will may have to worry about a larger influx into uh, school buildings and camps that we see overused. Now, as far as health interventions are concerned, I think, yes, the uh, health ministry has been working very hard, both the provincial and the central, but uh, here we do need a great deal of assistance. It's not just a question of vaccinations. Uh, women are, uh, especially Pakhtun women, remain inside their tents. They are mostly not able to go out except uh, some girl children. And uh, the temperatures are very high. They are not, uh, they don't have access to lady doctors and lady health visitors, which are sorely needed in much higher densities, uh, certainly at the camps. And the camps, you must understand, are a site of a daily anguish on 51 channels of Pakistan's television. It, uh, it really does produce uh, and refract an image of a state that is um, allowing its citizens to suffer, whereas that is not the case. But the point is that whatever the government is doing at this point is not enough. Uh, and while civil society has stepped up to the plate recently, uh, and again, the good news is that uh, every week you do see a change in uh, the availability of services in each of the camps. Uh, the pressures on the camps in terms of sanitation and uh, health care remain very high. Yes, there is uh, at least a week of, a week of food security guaranteed, but there is, there is a much more, uh, there's a much higher need of organized uh, health interventions, as I said, as well as a community participation, which is now, of course, becoming more and more available 
but uh, we do need to coordinate these efforts better, avoid duplication between international agencies, uh, and certainly not uh, to avoid pile-up and centralization in provincial hubs uh, such as Peshawar, where uh, you see a lot of wastage uh, of resources, even in the international agency offices. Uh, they are unable to cope with the numbers and the magnitude of the refugees coming in. So, uh, you know, to repeat the case that there is a great deal of assistance still required and perhaps some uh, management deficits also on the ground to be addressed in terms of coordination. Thank you very much. I will, uh, Mr. Flake. Yes, yeah, since I wasn't able to ask a, a couple of questions, let me, let me just ask uh, with regard to uh, I'll ask kind of the same question that I asked Mr. Bacon. How do we balance uh, the, the desire to use local groups um, and local NGOs with the, the fear that some that you might be contracting with might have sympathies with, uh, with the Taliban? Um, are, are partners uh, able to discern those links, or, or is that a, something that we should be concerned about? Uh, I'd, I'd like to answer that because I think one of the things we need to make very clear when we look at the potential of the jihadis exploiting this situation is that the IDPs have fled from Taliban controlled areas where they witnessed the most brutal of acts um, there were murders, public executions, women deprived of work, girl children not allowed to go to school, public property seized. This population sees the Taliban as criminals, and so they are. What is important now for us is not do local NGOs have sympathies to the Taliban, other than the jihadi groups and parties that obviously have sympathies with the Taliban, you don't see that either with the mainstream parties or with mainstream local NGOs. If anything, as Ms. Rahman stressed, there is at this point in time in Pakistan a real opportunity because not just in the Northwest Frontier Province but countrywide, there is now an antipathy to the Taliban and a great desire to see the state assert its writ, to see law enforcement, to see rule of law, to see justice, and to see these criminals brought to justice. What's important for us now is to make sure that this opportunity that exists is exploited to the fullest. Because if we don't, the jihadis will. Well, on, on that point, if I might, um, are there some uh, jihadi-related relief efforts going on in some of these areas? Uh, at the moment, and uh, and I, I'm assuming that that's what we're trying to get away from. Um, how does the local population react uh, when we we uh, try to uh, ban those jihadi-related uh, relief efforts? Or is that not one an of issue? the jihadi groups that has been? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, one of the jihadi groups that is operating there is a ban group. This jihadi group has was allegedly responsible for the Mumbai attacks. This jihadi group was banned once by the Musharraf government, re-emerged under a changed name, and it has resurfaced again under a changed name. It's the responsibility of the Pakistan government, and I think it's important for the United States to point that out to the Pakistan government, to make sure that a group that is declared a terror organization by the UN Security Council that is banned as a terror organization by Pakistan under its own laws is not allowed to operate. Um, but then when we're talking about the NGOs and, and the local community organizations, we're not talking about an organized jihadi group such as the lashkar e -Tayaba. Um It is important though that Islamist political parties are also there and have set up their own activities and you know that's again an exercise of, of uh, attempting to win hearts and minds. Have they succeeded thus far? 
I don't think they have. The stories that are coming out, Ms. Rahman talked about the media showing the face of, of the IDPs to Pakistanis every day, the human tragedy that Pakistan is facing. But the stories that the, that the IDPs have come out with are also being heard countrywide about what the Taliban are about and what the jihadis are about and how much of a threat they pose and how un-Islamic they are. The government's rhetoric also helps. It has changed immensely under the civilian government. When the Taliban are now being called criminals um, and murderers who should be brought to justice, as opposed to what we heard in the past, that they're jihadis. Ms. Ms. Raymond. <coughs> Thank you. If I, if I may just address uh, this question and, and reinforce what uh, Ms. Ahmed just said, uh, there is uh, there are obviously some groups working on the ground uh, and most of them are also religious parties like all other political parties people have set up camp but it, it is nothing like the jihadist intervention in terms of aid relief that we witnessed in the earthquake of 2005 I'd like to clar clarify that that is not happening and there are less and less stakers for um, very overt Taliban interventions or jihadist interventions and Islamist groups. Certainly there are welfare boxes and charities and tents operating everywhere uh, and they sometimes take cover in uh, religious uh, parties, uh, tents and, and, and offices as well. But it is nothing like the effort you saw earlier. This is mainly because it is swamped out uh, by uh, very organized uh, state and international aid, aid agency efforts also because interventions are happening through uh, the entry points of specific camps and there are 22 right now mostly in the frontier province which are regulated by the ERU which is the emergency relief response unit uh, and each camp has a different complexion to it, man, which is, you know, dictated largely by how uh, the local community is partnering with the government and international agencies. But I must say that it is heartening to see the narrative of anti-Talibanism take root in uh, public discourse. However, I would like to warn against complacency uh, in, in accepting that because this is something that can tip uh, very quickly if uh, successes on the battlefield are not translated into sustainable relief and rehabilitation and resettlement efforts for uh, the refugees. They are uh, uh, an anguished picture of human suffering every day. And this does, uh, every time we see groups and television uh, crews arriving at the camps, we do see uh, a blow to uh, public consensus against Taliban, uh, against Talibanization when, you know, women are, are, are seen as uh, destitute and children are uh, seen as running around wild-eyed in the sun without schooling. So one does sense that there is a huge cost uh, the Pakistani people are, are paying. Yes, uh, there may have been less intrusive ways to conduct a military operation, uh, and we mustn't get complacent at this public opinion that is building up every time. Uh, as I said, there is public anguish uh, over the, the IDP's uh, suffering and the humanitarian crisis. Questions are, and hard questions are asked in, in the public domain about the uh, efficacy and uh, uh, long-term uh, gains that we can make and hold uh, in terms of a military operation as well as the political gains we make from it. So I think this is something we have to capture and maintain without public momentum of uh, looking at how we uh, resettle eventually and, and, and provide relief in their areas is very important for the IDPs. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask each of our three witnesses a, a direct question that probably doesn't ex require a long answer, but uh, in the International Crisis Group report, there was a recommendation uh, that so-called jihadi groups, that that's the word Dr. Ahmed used, be prohibited or banned under the anti-terrorism law from participating in relief efforts. Uh, do all three witnesses believe that that is a wise thing to do, and if it is, what do they see as the impact of 
uh, shutting off that type of aid to people who may not be now receiving it? We'll start with you, Mr. Bacon. Um, I do think it's a wise thing to do. I, I accept the recommendation. Okay. Um, Ms. Raymond? I absolutely endorse that. Okay. And I know how you feel, Dr. Ahmed. You I, wrote I endorse it. that. Okay. Now, can they do it? Do they have the, uh, the power and the, and the will to do that? Mr. Bacon? Um, I think my Pakistani colleagues could speak more about the will and the power than I could. Okay. But yes, they should in, have the power to do it. And I think it's, it's instrumental in building um, a local r rule of law as well. It, it fits in with that. Ms. Rahman? Yes, I think that this is a problem that uh, we will have to expand outside the frontier province. We will have to take it to other provinces as well. Uh, mainly the Punjab, and we will have to address provincial capacity and will to do it. It's not something that uh, we have been able to do overnight. It will it will involve a complex interchange of uh, um, um, interventions in terms of legal as well as policing efforts, which, uh, frankly, I haven't seen uh, our ability on the ground to do, but this would be something that uh, a, a move that we can consider as a next step, and it's an important next step to take. Okay. All right. And, and Dr. Ahmed, I, I suspect that you feel it can be done. That's why you recommended that it should be done. Well, we absolutely believe it can be done. Uh, the police in Pakistan, despite the fact that its capabilities do need to be built on, we did a report on police reform. And we were heartened when we talked to senior police officials to find out that they really believed the only way to go was to arrest these criminals and to prosecute them. And that is, in fact, the only cure for militancy in Pakistan. Rule of law, you have to take them to the courts. You have to actually, first of all, respect your own law, because after all, these groups are banned under Pakistani law. And they are responsible for acts of egregious violence against Pakistani citizens. Now I'm going to read some excerpts, and then I have a question at the end, excerpts from the ICG report. The first one is a statement that said, the scale of the current IDP, uh, internally displaced person crisis, is a function of failed military policies that have enabled militancy to spread for several years. Uh, the second statement is a quote, uh, is by the head of the uh, Peshawar base NGO, it is the military is trying to improve its image by controlling the relief process. Uh, there is indeed little reason to believe that the military will be willing to work any more closely with civilian institutions and elected representatives than it has in its counterterrorism efforts. And lastly, the military's long-standing links to jihadi networks and its appeasement deals with militants the latest with the SWAT-based Taliban, have also understandably provoked doubts about its intentions in the current operation. There, if there is a peace deal, it is conclusive evidence that nothing has changed. There are members of Congress, I among them, who are concerned about giving United States military aid uh, to Pakistan without conditioning that aid on the military's in, uh, ability and will uh, to not cut another peace deal, but in fact to continue to assert themselves against uh, the extremist forces uh, on that basis so that the public in Pakistan can have a justifiable confidence in them, uh, condition it upon the military's allowing the civilian government uh, to extend the writ of law to Fatah and the Northwest Frontier Province and bring the justice system out there and the rule of law uh, on that basis. And uh, <coughs> members of Congress thought it was important enough uh, to not vote for other items uh, in the supplemental bill because those conditions had not been put in. Uh, now that's juxtaposed, of course, uh, but with the $200 million that is in the bill uh, for relief. Uh, I hear from each of our witnesses that they think both of those concepts are important. Is there a reason to think that passing the money for relief might not be money well spent if, in fact, the military is going to cut another deal uh, with the extremist elements and not allow the civilian government to take over the relief effort and, in fact, not do many of the things that we talked about here today? If, if I may address you may. Uh, just you. one of those concerns. 
Yes. Uh, on the ground, uh, frankly, uh, if you look at uh, relief efforts, they are, uh, the relief efforts are being run by the Emergency Response Unit and the Frontier Civilian Government. There is a special services group which is uh, run by a military Sp general, support. Sub special support group rather, that is being run by a military, uh, uh, a member of the military. Uh, we don't see their operations as, at least in the field, uh, very evident. We see everywhere the downstream workings of the uh, local community, which is again going right through the ERU as well as this, uh, the frontier government. But I do feel that we have to address this issue of peace deals with uh, not just band outfits, but all uh, warlords that control territory and cutting peace deals as a result of uh, the state's inability to uh, maintain its executive writ in the area. These always have, have shown uh, uh, opportunities for Taliban and jihadist and non-state actors to amass, uh, to find that they can regroup and they have always resulted in critical reversals for the state. So I think these are experiments that we need to avoid. And I must say at this juncture that uh, the provincial government of the frontier was very much involved and uh, very um, uh, forthcoming in cutting, uh, in cutting and recommending cutting a deal with uh, the Malakan militants. Uh, and I think this is something that we need to learn from this experience has shown the whole country that such deals don't work. And I think we need to take that, translate that experience into other areas as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, how important do you think it is to condition uh, military assistance on uh, a, a more committed uh, military effort to go after extremists and to allow the civilian government to extend its writ and become the uh, primary mover in relief efforts and in uh, the rule of law efforts? I think conditionalities on military assistance, which are very clear and confined to military assistance that do not extend to economic stroke development, stroke relief assistance, would be a signal sent to the Pakistani military. You know, one of the things we need to be clear about, it's in the military's own interests. What we've seen happen to this country in the past eight years as a result of peace deals, as a lack of resolve, because of the lack of resolve of the military and because it's failure to then allow the civilian in, uh, law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies to act. Um, the groundswell of opinion we see now against the Taliban um, is an indicator that the Pakistani public doesn't support this approach. The military has suffered casualties. If clear conditionalities and a clear signal is sent by the U.S. government, I think it will benefit the Pakistani military, benefit the Pakistani people, and benefit the United States. Uh, I make note that one of the quotes in the report was uh, from a, an official indicating that in Gulabag, in, in the, uh, the Union Council in Lower Deer, there was a military check post and a half a kilometer away, a Taliban check post. And the question obviously was, why doesn't the military just take a little trip down the road and eliminate that situation? And things like that continue to, uh, to exist and continue on. Uh, let me ask one last question, at least, if Mr. Flake has some more. The nature of assistance that's going right now, we understand about the food and other commodities that have to be brought to people uh, immediately, but there was great emphasis on the report, and Ms. Uh, Rahman also mentioned it, and I think Mr. Bacon did as well, about changing the nature of the leaf uh, in some respects to a cash basis uh, for certain reasons, whether job training or to start the economy or to allow people uh, the self-respect that's needed to uh, continue on. Uh, doctor, would you speak briefly to that, and if the other witnesses have a comment on it, uh, that would be appreciated as well. And particularly about if we, we do believe, that, the benefits of doing it and whether or not we can have any accountability with respect to it. Absolutely. I think it is important that in the Pakistani context, as opposed to perhaps other such similar situations, it is possible 
uh, to do it in such a way which will not only empower the communities that we would want to address, but also ensure that there is actually oversight and monitoring. The registration process might be slow, but there is a national identity card in Pakistan, and in fact, it brings these citizens into the mainstream because the identity card is needed for all sorts of purposes. They are biometric features that can be installed through NADRA, not a problem at all. Um, and what can the card be used for? There are multiple purposes that can be used for. It can be used as a debit card, which is income support. Let's not forget 85% of these IDPs aren't living in the camps. They are living with host communities who are themselves very poor. So just that ability to support the community through simply access to find the, the money that, that they need, I think is one. The children, we spoke about the children, half the IDPs being children and half of these IDPs being out of school. Parents don't have the money right now, but cash for education is something that actually the United States has used elsewhere. So cash vouchers for education, cash vouchers for health, cash vouchers for vocational education. Um, documentation is possible. There's a banking system that in these areas. It is not as though you cannot monitor this far more carefully, in fact, uh, than transferring goods to either the camps or through civil and military intermediaries. Well, thank um, you very much. Yes, I think cash Cash transfers would be very useful at this point because it would empower the uh, actual communities, as Samina said, uh, those that especially living with uh, uh, host communities, as well as those in the camps. Uh, there is a great deal of uh, anxiety about income opportunities being lost through displacement as well, and there is a danger of mass destitution. Uh, always uh, at such uh, crises points. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to add that, yes, there is an income support program and docu documentation process underway right now, uh, but that too needs support because we have an influx of refugees all the way down into the south, into the city of Karachi, which has become the largest Pakhtun city in the world, and uh, this is something we need to consider all the way downstream all reforms, all programs that we are looking at now must now move outside the frontier province as well and uh, bring into their ambit refugees dispersing all over the country, particularly uh, the very volatile city of Karachi, which is beginning to see uh, ethnic community unrest, which is unfortunate. But I'd, I'd like to just take the opportunity to mention uh, your uh, question, uh, but to, to address your, speak to your question about uh, conditioning aid, yes, while uh, U.S. experience has been uh, obviously uh, difficult with, uh, with old military funding and where uh, your coalition support funds did go and there have been issues of transparency in the past, I think right now uh, the atmosphere is politically very sensitive in Pakistan with the IDP crisis. And uh, while no one can uh, ignore the merits of transparency and, and obviously better governance, I'm sure some structures can be built, but conditioning aid at any level right now will be politically difficult for the government to sustain uh, in terms of engaging strategically and, and suggesting that our strategic ally is conditioning aid at a very difficult time for Pakistan. Hey, Ms. Raymond, does that go if we separate out the uh, civilian aid money and not put conditions on that and condition only the military money? Do you still feel the same way? I think that this will become a major issue in Pakistan. It will not be seen as uh, separated, which is unfortunate, and uh, perhaps I would recommend some kind of joint monitoring systems uh, because this is a very sensitive political uh, strategic moment in, in our history, and that may just become, uh, the, there may be public recoil against any kind of conditioning, and, and, and obviously they'll, it will be said that here is an old transactional relationship reasserting itself. It may be irrational uh, public outcomes, but this is what may be expected. I would recommend some kind of monitoring mechanism that you build in with the military. Well, thank you for that. Uh, do you have any more questions for you? 
My last question then would just be, is there anything that either of our witnesses uh, would care to add since you've been kind enough to wait as long as you did to, to have a chance to testify and you're coming such a long distance? Any thoughts that you want to leave us with before we close out the hearing that we might not have, have asked? Ms. Raymond? Yes, I, uh, I want, I, I don't, I think we cannot continue, we cannot stop reinforcing the issue of uh, the, the jihadists returning to these areas. I think that yes, we will be looking at police reform and capacity building and we can certainly go with uh, flushing out militants in the long run. But again, the word flushing out implies that we haven't uh, been able to either decommission their arms or reintegrate them into society. We have no programs for any such thing. And right now, I think our experience of the militants has been that they are not able to decommission nor be reintegrated in any significant numbers. Uh, so it's important to look at how communities will reform. Uh, it's not, I think we should be very clear that once the operations are over and citizens resettle, even the social transformations in these areas will uh, need change. They will need uh, institutional accommodation. Uh, we may not be able to go back to, say, uh, pre-Taliban Malakan. We will have to integrate uh, non-elite voices and communities that have been marginalized, including women. Uh, and the collective responsibility in Jirga system will have to be more, become more inclusive in terms of social justice uh, dispensation and perhaps even the PATA regulations will have to, which is provincially administered tribal areas uh, which, under which Malakand is operated, will have to be reformed, if not incrementally, then uh, slowly. Uh, but um, we do also, I think we, uh, we have serious concerns about uh, border interdiction. If, if Pakistan is going through all this, paying such a high human cost, then there is a lot of fear uh, about the Taliban rejoining uh, re, re, uh, uh, some of their uh, uh, colleagues and, and some old readouts may be uh, uh, reinvigorated. We feel that uh, the escape routes with uh, uh, through South Waziristan and, and North Waziristan and all of course the border agencies of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan must, must really be strongly interdicted uh, if we are not to see a return of the Taliban and, uh, and again reversals made both on the battlefield and in the communities that we have uh, displaced today. Thank you very much for your testimony May today I and add, for those comments. Dr. Sure. Yes. Um, may I just add this, that I think it's really important for us to remember that what we are seeing right now is the result of a peace deal. Um, the Taliban expanded their control, not because of their allies across the border, but because they were allowed to, through a peace deal sign, with the local authorities devised by the military. There is some indication that there will be operations conducted in the Wazir Estates, but there are also indications that some of the Taliban groups might be considered more acceptable than others. I think this is a hugely dangerous trend. It's essential that the United States makes it clear that no peace deal with any violent militant group that actually believes in the jihad, not only within Pakistan, but across Pakistan's borders, into Afghanistan, in India, and even beyond India in the West is acceptable. Uh, I think it's equally important to remember the other thing, the framework of this relief reconstruction um, effort. If the United States and U.S. officials stress the negative, which is, well, do the civilians have capacity? Then I think they will lose the opportunity of helping to build that capacity. If, again, they are doubt in some official quarters about civilian capacity of enacting political, administrative, and legal reforms that will bring Fata and Malakand into the mainstream, 
these are not helpful. It would be far more helpful if we, if the Obama administration, the U.S. Congress, supports a process of political reform that the Pakistan government, young, nascent democracy, would want to see in its territory because it sees it in the interests of the state and of the global community. Thank you very much. Mr. Bacon, do you have any final words of wisdom? Uh, thank you. I just uh, would like to go back to one point I made, which is uh, we need to guard against premature returns. All refugees want to go home, and everybody wants them to go home, but we have to make sure that when they go home, they go home to secure and sustainable communities. If they go home prematurely, um, this problem will not end. So um, what we have recommended is um, is an independent verification uh, process to decide when it's safe for refugees to go home and, um, and to follow that so we don't get uh, premature force backs. I know that this is a big issue for the Pakistanis and it's a big issue for the U.S. as well, but I, I just think that um, we've in the past seen high costs from premature returns and I hope we can avoid that here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bacon, for your testimony today, but also for the work that you do and your organization does. We're all indebted to you for that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ahmed, thank you for the work that you do in the International Crisis Group uh, in various places throughout the world. It's always helpful to have insightful uh, facts and information, and, uh, and you provide that on a regular basis. And I know members of parliaments and congresses around the world uh, rely on that work and appreciate it a great deal. Uh, the Honorable Sherry Raymond, thank you. Uh, for you taking your time today. I know things are very busy over there, and, and you were uh, very nice to take your time and give us uh, your valued opinion and insight into what's going on. I know that uh, I speak for all of my colleagues, I would suspect, and we, we say how sorry we are that you have such uh, difficult conditions uh, in, uh, in Pakistan at the moment, and we wish you only the best uh, in dealing with that situation, relieving the suffering of so many people. As you know, uh, Congress has acted and is in the process of acting again to try and uh, add some relief to that. Uh, we know that uh, everybody working together uh, can make it as comfortable as possible for people in an already bad situation. And we only wish you the very best in making that happen as quickly as possible. So again, thank you all very, very much for your testimony. Thanks again for all of our witnesses. Thanks to the folks at the embassy out in Islamabad for helping us with the, the hookup on that. And that, with that, this hearing is adjourned. And we'll now proceed to our second panel, which is a related briefing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm sorry that uh, there was so much delay with the votes earlier on and pushed you back a little bit. Uh, now I want to make sure we get started on this so that uh, we have votes coming up in a little while and I don't want to inconvenience you and make you have to wait for after those votes. So let me just briefly uh, say that we're receiving a briefing from Mr. Uh, Mikhail Gabadun? Gabadon. Yes. Gabadon. From the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, take a note uh, to, that the uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees staff member, Mr. Alexander Vorkovich, uh, was killed in last week's hotel bombing in Peshawar. Peshawar. Uh, on behalf of all of our colleagues here, so Mr. Flake and I and the staff here, we want to express our condolences to his family and to his co-workers uh, at the UNHCR. It serves as a reminder that you have so many staff over there who are in dangerous uh, conditions repeatedly and have the bravery uh, to put themselves in that position and sacrifice of themselves and their families. Um, Mr. Gabadon serves as a regional representative for the United States and the Caribbean for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. His career with UNHCR expands more than 25 years and includes services in Africa, Asia, Latin America, America, and Australia. So the frequent flyer miles are building up. He's worked in Pakistan as a field officer there and prior to his posting in Washington, served as a regional representative for UNHCR in Beijing. He attended the University of Bordeaux in France. I want to thank you again, sir, for making yourself available. And I would appreciate if you have a statement that you'd like to make, and then we'll have a little colloquy afterwards that meets your approval. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity given by your committee for us to brief you on our activities in Pakistan on behalf of the internally displaced people. Uh, I would at the outset like to say that our work would not be possible without the generous contribution we've had from the U.S. government to our activities, but also to the very close interaction we have with Ambassador Patterson and her staff in Islamabad and with our PRM colleagues here in Washington. So an excellent working relationship that I think contributes to uh, whatever success we, we may achieve. Uh, we have been operating in Pakistan for almost 30 years, starting uh, with the uh, Al -Af Afghan refugees. Um, and uh, through these 30 years, the success of the operation uh, has been due, to, one, to the tremendous welcome that the Pakistani population and government have given to the Afghans, but also to the very sustained effort by the international community to support that project. And throughout these years, our main implementing partner in Pakistan was the, Afghan Commissioner for, uh, the Pakistani Commissioner for Afghan Refugees. So to address myself to one of the questions you asked previously, there is expertise in managing these sort of situations in Pakistan, expertise that has been tested uh, over time. We first uh, got involved with IDPs in August last year with the movements of uh, persons taking place out of the Bajor agency in, in the federal administrative tribal areas and after that of, from the Mohman agency. And by April, we had registered some 550,000 people who had already left. Since the end of April and early May, we have witnessed the, in speed and size, the largest population movement since the exodus from Rwanda uh, some 15 years ago. Uh, not for the same conditions, I'm not trying to uh, compare the situation, but certainly in terms of speed and, um, and size. As has been said, we have now about 240,000 people living in camps, so it's a little bit over uh, 10% uh, out of the 2 million that are, have been confirmed by the verification of the registration. Uh, we do have some 100,000 who live in camp-like situation in schools or in public facilities that will have to be uh, given back to their normal use in July when the, the school uh, resume. And we have an increasing number who are moving outside of the NWFP area and moving into Punjab and Sindh. And now it is estimated that there may be up to 300,000 people moving in this direction. Our response is part of a broader uh, UN response in which we have assigned three responsibility, which is protection, shelter, and camp management. I'd like to address very quickly what we do under each of these chapters and then address myself to the challenges we face uh, in the coming months. Uh, protection is essentially uh, registration. We are supporting the government to uh, register uh, IDPs in, for those population who are uh, living with uh, local people in, in villages and towns. It is the uh, Minister of Social Welfare who is doing the registration in the camps is the Commissioner for Afghan Refugees. And here I would like to stress something very important, that for population living in a conflict area, the government has maintained registration in the hands of civil authorities. We think this is essential. It's not necessarily what happens in other areas of the world, and we value very much this response by the Pakistani government. And we're also supporting uh, NADRA in the verification exercise to weed out double or triple registration as may, as may be happening. Registrations allow us to give ID cards, to identify vulnerable groups, to start working on family reunification, particularly for children who have uh, lost their parents in the, in, the, in the exodus, and to uh, make a determination of who will need what sort of assistance. Um, so it's an important, it's a very important protection tool. We are trying to look now at other issues of protection that always happen when people see these sort of conflicts, which is gender-based violence, which is unfortunately something that affects population who suffer uh, this sort of conflict in whatever continent uh, we are. We've experienced this in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, and Pakistan would not be exempt of these sort of issues, but we're just at the beginning of looking into these particular uh, delicate uh, issues. In terms of shelter, we have to remember that this is a population, a mountain population who is coming back in lowland valleys. They're not used to the heat, which actually is unbearable right now. And one of our main approach to shelter is to try to, what we call, summarize the living conditions. We have to make sure that over tents you have shade. We have to make sure that uh, people have act that we develop electricity so they can have uh, fans, uh, that we have lighting in the camps for security and that we have water coolers. So quite, quite an adaptation 
of the conditions for these people to suffer as least as possible from a rather dramatic change of environment uh, to the one they are used to. We also have to develop a privacy system, which is culturally uh, required, the Purda mechanism, by putting walls between the tents. But this is not just a respect for culture. It's, it also has an important protection uh, impact. Um, the camp management function is basically identifying new sites. Right now we have 21 camps. This is not enough. The camps are quite congested, and we increasingly have people who are moving out of the families with whom they found Sakura at the beginning because the condition, these families are poor and they cannot help them anymore. So we feel that over the next weeks and months, the number of people who want to reside in camps will just increase, and we have to identify sites, prepare these sites, and uh, also develop a community approach to running of the camps whereby the communities themselves are associated in the decisions that affect the way assistance is given in, in the camps. The um, challenges we will face in the immediate is to adjust very quickly to changing weather. The monsoon is coming. With the monsoon we will have flooding. We need to make sure these places are properly drained. And with the floods will come the scourge of malaria, again, something that these mountain population are not used to and that can be, have a devastating effect on this uh, population. And then a few months after that, we'll have the beginning of winter, which we will require a winterization of the camp. So we have quite a few challenges in terms of adjusting the conditions in the camp to make life as bearable as possible to these people um, uh, who, who are in camps and who, who, are, who are very crowded. The second challenge is that we need to um, develop a system to distribute um, items to the people who stay with families. As we say, it's the majority of them. We have developed uh, about 80 uh, hubs together with WFP so that food and non-food items can be uh, distributed. Uh, we are in the process of responding to those people who have been identified to the registration. We are far from reaching them all at present, but this is certainly one of the challenges we have to make sure that the, the burden they bear on the local population is as reduced as, uh, as, uh, as possible. We want to register those who have left for Sindh and Punjab. The government is not very keen for them to receive assistance, I suppose because they don't want to generate the pool factor, but at least we want to be able to register them so they have this ID and therefore they have a protection mechanism. So that's another spread out of our operations uh, further uh, into, into Pakistan. The next uh, major uh, challenge will be the preparation for returns. And I cannot subscribe more to what uh, Ken Bacon said before. We all want people to go back. As soon as they go back, the better, because life in camp is not, is, is not uh, something we, which is wished for and, and could uh, uh, generate some symptoms of dependency. And life in local families bay bears uh, inordinate uh, uh, pressure on the local population. But returns have to follow a certain series of principles. They must be voluntary. They cannot be a subject of political expediency to just demonstrate that things are better. Uh, we will have to look at issues of unexploded ordinance in areas of return, uh, questions of uh, destruction of infrastructure, where it's road, bridges, um, that uh, are, are required to make sure people can, can move back, and then uh, see what are the support the Pakistani government needs to reestablish service, services, whether health and education, and certainly the, the rule of law, as has been very clearly identified by our colleagues. All that is not necessarily under UNHCR, but we must make sure that all this is in place before we can really uh, make sure people go. One of our role in return will be to gather information to make sure that displaced people have sufficient information on what's happening down there eventually, help them to go and see, etc., but not uh, press uh, and urge returns. As I say, as a matter of political expediency, we much too often suffer these sort of pressures, and this would be dramatic because it would be reverting to the cycle that we have just, uh, just witnessed. In this context, we have two uh, uh, great difficulties to overcome. Uh, one is funding. A, a lot has been uh, said about that. The response of the international community remains rather uh, tepid. Uh, we had initially, within the UN, made this appeal for a little bit over 500 million. Our share of that was 105. Uh, we got funded for about 40 percent. Right now, we have reviewed our needs in light of the, the recent figures of, of 2 million. Uh, we need, just for UNHCR, about 140 million. I suppose that the other agencies will see an increment of the same order, and that means we're 
uh, funded to about 30% of our needs. And this is not counting on possible additional outflows from Waziristan, where we understand that an operation is just beginning, as was, as was uh, foreseen. Uh, so funding is a, is a, is a dramatic uh, uh, constraint. Uh, there is, in this country, I think, a proper appreciation of what is at risk in Pakistan. There's certainly on the part of the Pakistani. I'm not sure on the part of the rest of the international community there is such a sense. And in the very words of my High Commissioner uh, this morning, uh, response to this crisis is not just a question of moral obligation because of the dire suffering of the people. It's a question of, as he put it, enlightened self-interest because our failure to respond carries out uh, security implications for Pakistan and the region, which are quite, uh, quite severe. And the second big challenge we have, you've alluded to it at the beginning, Mr. Chairman, security concerns are important, and we are in the process of trying to balance how can we develop a uh, field presence that is efficient in responding to the needs without exposing our colleagues to unnecessary risk. We have to take some risk. We have to make sure these risks are not uh, exaggerated. And we are right now in a review on how we should operate to reduce risk to our staff and to make sure we can keep on uh, working there, but certainly no talk about uh, pulling out. So I'll stop here because I think much has been said before, and thank you very much again for your interest. Well, thank you uh, very much. Mr. Flake, I just invite you to jump in anytime too. We'll just have a, a conversation here if you like. Um, do you see any evidence that the Pakistani government has actually started the planning that will have to be involved for the return eventually of these folks. It would seem that they can't be returning this summer or this winter, and probably in, in likely who we're looking at next spring yeah. uh, at the earliest. So it gives them a fair amount of time. But do you see anybody actually doing the planning uh, for all that will be necessary to, to bring people back in a safe environment and one that gives them, as you mentioned, the health care and the education and the job uh, structure? <coughs> At present, I think there is more talk about returns than actual uh, action. The government has committed itself, and this is absolutely welcome, to reestablish uh, public services as a basic condition for, for return. Uh, I think we have to realize that in, in the past years, uh, civilian administrators of the government have suffered from the insurgency tremendously, murders of uh, doctors, professors, uh, mayors, etc. So they, there is a shortage of, of human resources that I am not quite sure how they will address, but will be a constraint into the reestablishment of these services. But if experience tells us anything, the people who moved from Bajor uh, last, uh, August last year are still in the camps, and there's been almost no return. So I think it's going to take more time than we think, despite the, the talks about it. Sure. Back on the security issue uh, with the, your colleague being uh, killed there just recently, what, do you employ private security then, did you say before? Or? Do you employ private security guards as well, and are they augmented by uh, uh, security from local police forces? How does that work? Well, we, by, by definition, we want the relief effort to be dealing from the military operation. So we cannot operate relief as part of a, of a, of a more uh, militarized uh, effort, and we want these two things to remain quite distinct. So we have usually private security guards in our offices, etc. These are very good against thieves. They, te they don't tend to be so efficient uh, against more, more aggressive uh, 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 sort of person. We have no evidence, I must say, that the bombing in the, in the hotel was directed at UN staff in particular. It's just mm -hmm. a place where, where international people do gather, well, etc., and it's visible. I've been to the shower. Place. That's a, a particularly hard place to, uh, to secure, I'm yes. sure. Um, so. Well, one way we will respond, sorry if I may, is probably by having a, a lighter-footed presence of international staff and starting to work much more through uh, Pakistani staff. Uh, and thank God in Pakistan you do find uh, uh, competent and well-trained uh, people. So we have to review the way we, we, we operate generally in the sort of proportion between internationals and locals. I was going to ask you about that. The, um because we've had a lot of recommendations back about the talent that is in Pakistan, the quality of people there that are able and capable of doing this work. So your organization is, in fact, reaching out to many more of, of the uh, domestic Pakistani uh, population to try and help with your efforts as well. Yes, I think this is where we are going to go. Uh, our director of the Asia Bureau, head of security and head of emergency services are currently in Pakistan to make a review of our operation after the incident last, uh, last week. And that will be ready next week, but I, I think it's going to be in this direction. Okay. 
Just one other question. Uh, talking about premature return, and guarding against that unexploded ordinance or whatever else are the issues, how do you enforce that, or can you? Um, I know it's a difficult balancing act there. Well, if people want to go, of course, this is their choice, and we, there is nothing you can do. So, and the risk, of course, is that if assistance is not good enough, and their situation becomes terrible in the places where they have found refuge right now, and they go back because going back is the worst alternative, then we have a recipe for, for catastrophe. If they go because they really feel they have their orchards to, to tend and they want to rebuild their, their homes, etc., and we are convinced that the return is voluntary, we have to help them. What we must avoid is pressure for them to go back as a sort of uh, symbol that things are back to normal when all the premises have not been uh, insured. Uh, security through the removal of ordinances, uh, establishment of services, reparation of infrastructure, infrastructure etc. How is the urgency going to become um, spread to the international community? How are they going to be impressed with the urgency of this so that they uh, perhaps step up and, and fill in some of the gap between what the United States is providing and what the UN thinks is necessary? Well, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Right now, as I said, uh, the U.S. has been our main supporter. Uh, Europe is not showing a uh, tremendous desire to respond. Uh, we are uh, trying our best to convince them, as I say, that it's not just a question of, uh, of moral obligation, but that we, we all have uh, broader interest in, in, in helping Pakistan and sometimes appealing to the self-interest of nation can, can, can help. Uh, the High Commissioner will personally go to uh, the Gulf states, uh, I think, in a week to try to also ask for their assistance. They should also uh, understand that they have uh, immediate interest in in this situation of getting out of hand. But they haven't been overly responsive so far, have they? No. On that, that's interesting. Uh, you mentioned in your, in your remarks about reunification of families. Can you tell us a little bit about the magnitude of that issue? How many families are not just displaced but also separated? Are you finding a high proportion of people in that circumstance or not? I don't have these figures, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I can look into them and, 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 and forward them to the committee when I have them. We're still trying to sort out information. What we found out recently, and certainly with some of the NGOs we work with, like the International Rescue Committee, there are lots of tents, for example, where you have children only, whether they just guard the tents, whether the parents are doing something, or whether they've been just left there without uh, any indication of where the family has gone. We are not quite sure, and this is something that we have... Uh, call the attention of the government on that, and we're working with the Commission of Afghan Refugees to try to sort out these issues. As, as more and more people either leave their host family because the burden has just become too high or uh, exit the school buildings because they're going to be put back to educational use and, and the hospitals or other buildings, what is your estimate right now of how many additional camps, sites will need to be constructed uh, over and above the 21 that exist now? I think we're looking at 10 additional sites, but we have to make sure that these sites are, they can be drained properly, that we can bring electricity, etc. So I, again, I do not have the exact details, but I think we are planning for a fairly uh, substantial uh, uh, inflow from people who have already left the, uh, the, the conflict zones and are around, the, uh, around Peshawar and who will have to go into camps at some point. I want to thank you, Mr. Kabadan. Um, the work you do is just uh, incredible, and all your staff and the folks that work with you, is, it's greatly appreciated uh, around the world, but particularly here. Uh, well, the sacrifice and the risk that we mentioned earlier, unfortunately evidenced by what happened last week, uh, just brings it to two-stock uh, relief. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come here and, uh, and brief us on that. This is information that we need to have to share with our colleagues and make sure that we have the proper response. So again, thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. The briefing is adjourned. Thanks.